Hey guys, it's Meredith here again, and finally we've made it to the case practice. So we're going to go through a couple of my real life cases from clinic, um, and hopefully at the end you'll be able to understand how I read PFTs, so hopefully you'll be able to start reading PFTs on your own. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so here's how PFTs look. The first thing I wanna look at is spirometry, remember? And so what we're gonna look at here is the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Remember, if the FEV1 to FVC ratio is low, then that is indicative of airflow limitation. So this patient, when you look at the lower limit of normal, it's 69, and when you look at his number, it's 65. So that is lower, and so therefore you can say that this patient does indeed have an airflow limitation. I just wanna take a moment right here to let you guys know that there's a lot of numbers and there's American Thoracic Society guidelines and there's gold stage guidelines and you're gonna hear all about this, but really what you wanna pay attention to is the lower limit of normal because at the end of the day, you wanna be comparing the patient to what is gonna be expected for their baseline and that's gonna be based off their age, their um, race, their height, etc. And so use these lower limits of normal to your advantage and um, just know that you don't have to necessarily memorize those numbers. All right, so next I look at the lung volume. So that's the number two thing I look at. You wanna pay attention to the TLC, the total lung capacity, the RV, the residual volume, and the ERV, the expiratory reserve volume. Remember, if TLC is increased, then that um, can go along with your airflow limitation in the form of air trapping and hyperinflation. If TLC is decreased, then you have a restrictive component of lung disease. So here we look at the lower limit of normal again. It's clearly much higher. So this is indicative here of hyperinflation of the lungs. The RV is um, also increased, which is indicative of air trapping. So in summary, this person has hyperinflation, as you can see from the increased TLC, and they have air trapping, as you can see um, with the increased RV. Um, and these both go with our prior diagnosis of airflow limitation that we saw on spirometry. I don't wanna forget about the ERV. So notice in this patient that the ERV is actually a little bit lower than you would expect, 38%. So you would just wanna check the BMI in this person because this is indicative of obesity. So the last and third thing I wanna look at is the diffusion capacity. And that's the DLCO we talked about in the last lecture. So this person's lower limit of normal is 18 and their actual is 25. So they have a normal DLCO. So we can just say that there's no diffusion issue going on with this patient. So in summary, one, we definitely have an airflow limitation present and we can tell that from spirometry. Number two, um, based on volumes, we have both um, hyperinflation by the TLC plus air trapping by the RV. So based on this, what do you guys think the flow volume loop is going to look like? All right, well, here it is. So essentially what you can see here is the normal in the first line and the patients in the second line. Um, and you can see that it slopes down consistent with airflow limitation. On this line, what's interesting is this is the volume against time, and you can see that the patient is breathing out forever, also consistent with airflow limitation. And on physical exam, that is called prolonged expiratory phase. So what do you think this guy has? So he has asthma, and he's an interesting guy. He has it secondary to something called Church-Strauss. So case two, so again, number one, look at spirometry. What do you look for? The FEV1 to FEC ratio, lower limit of normal 69, this patient's 91. They're doing great, so that's normal. So a normal FEV1 to FEC ratio means that this patient does not have airflow limitation. The next thing we wanna look at is why is that number at the top red? So the FVC, the force vital capacity, is low in this person. And while that cannot tell us anything definitively, it can suggest that their TLC may also be low. So good thing we always look at the lung volumes next. So lung volumes, number two step after spirometry. What do we look at? The TLC, and in this patient, it actually is slightly lower than the lower limit of normal. So we can say that this TLC is low 
And this essentially confirms what we are suspicious of, which is a restrictive disease process that is going on. I also just want to point out this patient's lower ERV, which could be suggestive of obesity, but could also just go along with their restrictive disease process. The third thing that we always look at is the diffusion. Remember the DLCO. So here, this is significantly lower than the lower limit of normal. And so we can say that something's wrong with the diffusion. Is it alveolar or is it a capillary cause? Remember the differentials from the lecture on DLCO. So what do you guys think is going on and how would we be able to figure this out? So remember the differential for the decrease in DLCO, alveolar versus capillary. Things that are alveolar like fibrosis and emphysema, they affect your surface area or lung volume, remember? Capillary issues like a pulmonary embolism or pulmonary hypertension or anemia should have nothing to do with your lung volume. So that's your clue for this patient. So remember, we said this patient had a low TLC, confirmative of restriction. So this patient must have an alveolar cause of the decrease in the DLCO. So if you don't believe me yet, here's the graph. So that's normal person, and then this is our patient, significantly more narrow, indicative of restrictive disease. Also, on the right-hand side, this curve is um, a lot less time, as you can see, compared to the prior. And that goes along with sort of the restrictive process because they have um, more elastic lungs, if you will. They have a lower compliance, and so they snap back pretty quick. And remember, this patient also had that decreased DLCO, which we thought because of the volumes was probably due to an alveolar cause. And you guys were right. So the diagnosis here is pulmonary fibrosis, and in this patient, it's secondary to rheumatoid arthritis. So as we say on the wards, strong work, guys. You solve both of the patient's problems. Um, stay tuned. We're going to have pulmonary hypertension, neuromuscular disease, and more complex flow volume loops in the upcoming presentations. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something today. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at mkgreer at emory.edu. Happy studying.